Hello and welcome. My name is Isolt O'Driscoll and I'm here this morning to, to talk to you as part of the Coffee Conversation series at the Hugh Lane Gallery. In normal circumstances, these talks would take place on site in the gallery in Parnell Square. Unfortunately, the coronavirus restrictions have meant that the gallery has been obliged temporarily to close its doors. However, I'm very happy to give this talk to you remotely. So, while it's unfortunate that we can't meet in person, I hope you can sit back, enjoy your coffee, while I tell you about today's topic. Now, I'll just hide the video panel so as not to distract us, and then we can start. I'm going to focus on this painting. It's a portrait of Douglas Hyde, who was a major figure in the Irish cultural renaissance. He led the Irish language revival movement in the late 19th century, and then he went on to become the first president of Ireland. The artist is John Butler Yeats. Now, John Butler Yeats is probably best known for his family. He's the father of William Butler Yeats, the poet and Nobel Prize winner, and of Jack B. Yeats, the expressionist, very famous expressionist painter. But he was also a talented artist, specialising in portraiture. And like Douglas Hyde, he played an important part in the Irish cultural revival movement. As through his son William, he was friendly with his main players, and he sketched or painted most of them, providing a record of the era. Now, before I talk about the portrait of Douglas Hyde, I just want to introduce you a bit more to John Butler Yeats and his work, and to, and to explain his connection with Hugh Lane and the collection in the Municipal Gallery because he played a role in Ye Lane's project for a modern art gallery in Dublin, as we'll see. Now, here is a portrait of John Butler Yeats in later life. He was born in County Down in 1839, the son of a clergyman. The family was well off and they were very well connected. They were descended from the Butlers, Dukes of Ormond, and hence the name, the Butler in the name Butler Yeats and they had inherited estates in Thomastown. When Yeats's father retired, the family moved to Dublin. They were connected with the ruling officials at Dublin Castle and they frequented the best, very best social circles in the city. And for example, they also, they were friendly with Oscar Wilde's family, William Wilde, and they used to dine with them. So the Yeats family were effectively members of the Irish ascendancy. John Yeats studied law at Trinity and then he went on to King's Inns to train as a barrister. And he is supposed to have deviled in the law courts for Isaac Butt, that is, done work, worked for him for no money to earn his trade, as it were. Now, Isaac Butt, as well as being a, a lawyer, was also an a very well known politician and he led the Irish Home Rule Party in the House of Commons. So, John Butler Yeats moved in the very best. Uh, circles in Dublin. In 1862, Yeats went to visit a school friend in Sligo called George Pollexfan. Now while he was there, he met and fell in love with and immediately almost became engaged to his school friend's sister, Susan Pollexfan. They got married the following year in 1863. Now the couple had four surviving children, all of whom became significant players in the Irish cultural scene. And here are some sketches of them made by their father at different times. As well as William M. Jack, who you can see top and bottom on the left, there were two girls who were known in the family as Lily and Lolly, and you can see them there on the right. Now they had to set up the Dunemer workshops, which is a project to produce Irish art craft work and revive it, as it were. And they then went on to found the Cooler Press. Now, the Cooler Press was very important, involved in publishing books of Irish interest, including W.B. Yeats's poems and various plays by people such as John Millington Singh. And they even appear in James Joyce's Ulysses, where unfortunately he refers to them as the Weird Sisters. Yeats qualified as a barrister and was admitted to the bar in 1866. But it seems that his heart wasn't really in the law. And almost on a whim, in 1867, he gave it up, he sent his family temporarily back to Sligo to live with his in-laws, and he moved to London to train to become a painter. Now he had enjoyed drawing as a child apparently, and was very good at it. 
He used to sketch his friends at school, and then, while attending at the law courts in Dublin, he'd been in the habit of drawing caricatures, that swift sketches of various people, judges, barristers, witnesses, and so on, people who were attending at the law court that he saw. And these were very much admired by his friends and acquaintances, and it seems that this encouraged him in his decision to pursue a career as an artist. He first attended Heatherley's Art School in London, where he came under the influence of the Pre-Raphaelites, and his early work reflects this. For example, this picture from the early 1870s. It's called Pippa Passes and it illustrates a scene from a play by Robert Browning. Now, its features, its visible outlines, its bright warm colours and its detailed background, they're all features of the pre-Raphaelite pre painting. And the pre-Raphaelite school was probably the dominant artistic style in Britain at this time. Yeats then moved on to the Slade School and his style gradually developed into something more modern. He'd be more concerned with revealing personality than in simply illustrating a narrative. And a good example of that is this portrait of Lily Yates from 1888 called My Daughter. And you can see its broader, looser brush strokes and the emphasis placed on the central figure rather than the surrounding features, which are actually quite blurry by comparison. This picture is in the Hugh Lane collection and you can see it. Fairly soon, Yeats began to concentrate on portraiture, which he was most interested in, and he decided in due course to become a professional portrait painter. Now, while portraits have been around in some form or other for as long as art itself, more or less, the rise of the middle classes in the 19th century saw a huge increase in demand for them. Um, whether they were looking for a record of themselves for posterity, or to mark important events such as a marriage, or even just to display their wealth and status, people became very interested in acquiring portraits of themselves, their families, and sometimes even their pets to hang in their homes. Having your portrait painted was something of a status symbol for newly rich industrialists and professional men. And portrait painting became an important source of income for professional artists working in Britain and Ireland at the time. And this is what Yeats decided to pursue a career in. Yeats had done very well at art school where his teachers thought highly of his work. So he felt that he should prosper at his chosen career. However, success eluded him. And this might have been due to his approach to his work, at least in part. He was unwilling to actively seek commissions in London, and he didn't follow up any encouragement that he received from other artists. For example, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who was the leading pre-Raphaelite artist of the time, had seen Yeats's painting and admired them, and he came to visit his studio while Yeats, unfortunately, was out. But Yeats refused to follow up with him because, as he said, he felt that he wasn't ready to show his work yet. Basically, that it wasn't up to scratch. So he just ignored the, the approach and didn't follow up. Any commissions that he did get were through the efforts of his friends. And he had said many, many friends. Two early examples are the commission for the work Pippa Passes that I showed you earlier. And this one for the Herbert family of Muckress House in Killarney, uh, called Mrs. Herbert and Muckress with a Maltese Terrier which he travelled back to Ireland to complete in 1873. When he did succeed in getting commissions, he worked so slowly, constantly changing things, that he was always seriously late, sometimes years late, in delivering the final work. And quite often his paintings remained unfinished, or patrons became so annoyed with the delay that they refused to accept them. They basically went off to do something else. They got someone else to complete, to, to do a portrait. And in fact, this portrait of Mrs. Herbert that you see here, when it finally arrived in Killarney, was rejected by the family and sent back to the painter. Now, this was done for several different reasons, but among them could well have been the fact that there was such a delay in getting it. And the problem seems to have been that Yeats was unable to complete a painting to his own satisfaction. 
he was a perfectionist and was never satisfied that his work was ever fully up to scratch. He'd begin a painting and then after a while decide that it wasn't good enough. So what he would do is he'd discard the whole thing as often as not and start again. And William Butler Yeats, his son, told of once meeting a stranger in the street in London, who, and the stranger, when he heard who William's father was, asked, is he the painter who scrapes out every day what he painted the day before? Yeats demanded as well so many sittings that his subjects often became frustrated and refused to return. They felt it was a waste of time, they had better things to do. And then, if a painting happened to be going well and the sitter was pleased with its progress, they were understandably very annoyed to come back the next time and find that he'd scraped everything away and it was starting again. So Yates really did try his sitter's patience as well. These delays and failures to complete commissions meant that Yates very often remained unpaid. Even when he did manage to sell his work, he either asked very little for it or he didn't like to demand payment if it wasn't immediately forthcoming. So along with everything else, he was a bad businessman. This lack of material success meant that he was always short of money and the family moved from one financial crisis to another. His wife and children had eventually joined him in London when he went over there in the 1860s. But because of continual money troubles, they often had to move back to Sligo for long periods. And his son, Jack, actually more or less spent his childhood in Sligo with his grandparents because Yates wasn't able to support him properly. Yates was very bad with money. He had inherited his father's estate in Thomastown, but it was heavily mortgaged and he was constantly in debt. He was always borrowing money from his wife's family, from his own family and from his friends. And these were often just to pay food bills. In addition, his marriage was unhappy. Susan Pollockson apparently resented having to live in poverty in London when she had quite reasonably expected to be the wife of a successful barrister in Dublin. By all accounts, the couple were very unalike. While he was friendly and sociable and with a youthful and optimistic disposition, she was described as being glum and morose and generally disappointed in life. She suffered a series, she actually suffered a series of strokes in 1887, which rendered her an invalid, and she died in 1900. Now, despite his continuing lack of success, it's actually a mark of Yeats's character that he never gave up hope. He kept expecting to, as he put it himself, turn the corner and achieve artistic recognition. And by his own lights, he worked very hard in pursuit of this aim. He submitted entries to the Royal Academy every year, even though they weren't often accepted. The family actually moved back to Dublin in 1880, where Yeats hoped to be able to set up a practice as a portrait painter in the city. And Yeats joined the RHA, which was the Irish equivalent of the Royal Academy, and became a full member in 1882. He submitted portraits to their annual show every year. He also joined the Dublin Sketching Club and helped to organise an exhibition of Whistler's paintings there in 1886. And this was actually quite an important, one of the earliest modern um, exhibitions of modern painting in Dublin. And John B. Yeats was involved in it. And finally, and more importantly for himself, Yeats made friends with Sarah Purser. She was a portrait painter and stained glass artist who was very active in the Dublin art world. And here you can see a sketch that he made of her. Yeats always made sketches of his close friends. She would in due course be very helpful to him. Now over time, as success continued to elude him, Yeats' sons William and Jack started to eclipse him and he began to fade into the background. He moved back to London in 1888, having not having made a success as a portrait painter in Dublin, and he was hoping to make some money as an illustrator there. But he was still dogged by financial troubles, and also by his wife's illness. He continued to contribute paintings to both the RA and the RHA every year, but was often success, unsuccessful. And finally, in 1901, when he was 62, 
every single one of his submissions to the RHA were rejected, much to his disappointment. But here, finally, his luck changed. Now, when Sarah Purser discovered that the RHA had rejected Yeats's paintings in early 1901, she was very annoyed. She felt that the art establishment needlessly looked down on Irish artists. And in particular, she thought that John Butler Yeats and the painter Nathaniel Holm had been very unfairly neglected. So, in July 1901, she organized a two week retrospective exhibition of their work in St. Stephen's Green, which she paid for herself, including a catalog. The exhibition included around 44 pieces by Yeats, both oil paintings and sketches. And it included, it included portraits such as Isaac Bott and the veteran Fenian John O'Leary, as well as this genre painting, The Bird Market which is now also in the Hugh Lane collection, and you can actually see it at the gallery. The exhibition was a great success, and very large attendances, of particularly of the great and the good, and it was actually something of a social event. And also reviews were very enthusiastic, especially about Yeats's portrait, which were likened to old masters by some people. And one critic even compared Yeats to Rembrandt with regard to his portraits. Among the visitors to the exhibition was Hugh Lane. He was a wealthy London art dealer and the nephew of Lady Gregory. And here are photos of the two. Lady Gregory was a close friend of William Butler Yeats, as well as being a leading light in the Irish literary revival movement. Now, probably influenced by his aunt, yet Lane was becoming increasingly interested in promoting an equivalent Irish artistic revival. He was very impressed by the quality of what he saw at the Sarah Purser exhibition, and he thought that it demonstrated a distinctive school of Irish painting which was worth encouraging. In fact, it's probably after this, his visit to this exhibition that he first conceived of the project to establish a permanent, permanent gallery of modern art in Dublin. Hugh Lane's immediate response to the Sarah Purser exhibition was to commission from Yeats a series of 20 portraits of noteworthy Irish people as poets, writers and intellectuals, as well as politicians and members of the British administration. And he set Yeats up in a studio on St. Stephen's Green to enable him to get on with painting them. He intended that these works would be donated to a national portrait gallery, which he envisaged would be established in Dublin in due course. And when the municipal gallery opened in Harcourt Street in 1908, these portraits were hung on the walls and the stairwell, so you could see them as you came in. Now, while the commission was for 20 portraits, in the end, Yeats only actually completed five. He delayed and revised endlessly and worked far too slowly for Hugh Lane. Now, it seems that Lane hadn't appreciated Yeats's reputation for procrastinating when he gave him the commission in the first place. Yeats was a very energetic person and he had a specific idea of what he wanted and when he expected to receive it. And unfortunately, Yeats wasn't really on the same page. For example, Yeats, Lane had initially specified head portraits, while Yeats preferred to do larger three-quarter length ones, and this is what Yeats delivered. In the end, Lane gave up waiting for Yeats and he got his friend William Orpen to finish the commission. And the problem seems to be that Yeats could only paint a portrait if he liked, or at the very least felt a connection with the person sitting for him. He once wrote to a friend that he was only really able to paint what he called friendship portraits. That's portraits of people he knew and was involved in. His most successful works were generally writers and thinkers. He had little sympathy with politicians and was unable to make a mental connection with them. As a result, he tended to be dissatisfied with the portrait which he was painting of them, and more often than not, he abandoned it. This is borne out by the results of the Hugh Lane Commission. The five that Yeats completed were almost all of writers. For example, John Millington Singh. 
and it was then left to Orpen to paint the more worldly and political figures, such as J.P. Mahaffey, who was the Provost of Trinity College. Now here you can see both painters side by side. It's Yeats is John Millington Singh on the left and Orpen's Mahaffey on the right. These two paintings are also in the Hugh, Gallery, Hugh Lane Gallery and you can see them there. Now, it's generally accepted that some of Yeats's best paintings were done in this period, at the beginning of the century. What some people call his Irish Renaissance paintings, because they depicted so many of the members of the cultural revival movement. He could be said to have captured the atmosphere of the whole Irish cultural Renaissance, as whether in paintings or in sketches, he produced likenesses of more or less everyone associated with it produced a record and gave a record of the people involved at the time. Now we come to the painting we're discussing today, this portrait of Douglas Hyde. It's a good example of Yeats's work as it demonstrates his particular style and artistic techniques. Douglas Hyde was a friend of Yeats. Uh, both he and Yeats's son William were part of the intellectual circle that had formed around Lady Gregory and John Yeats and Hyde probably first met at her home in Cool Park in Galway. Another son of a clergyman, Douglas Hyde was born in Roscommon in 1860, but the family's ancestral home was actually in Castle Hyde in County Cork. As a child, he used to listen to the local people around him speaking Irish. He became interested in it and learned to speak it himself from them. And through this, he developed a love of Irish culture. He studied ancient languages in Trinity College and then went on to become an academic. He remained very interested in the Irish language and was conscious that it was in danger of being lost as more and more people learned to speak English. He thought that this would be a great tragedy for the Irish people, so in 1893 he co-founded the Gaelic League to save the language from extinction and to promote all aspects of Irish heritage, such as music, legends, customs and so on. And as a result, he came into contact with Lady Gregory and her circle, and by extension, Hugh Lane, and he collaborated with them in the promotion of Irish culture. And he was a well-known figure in the Irish Renaissance. Renaissance. Using the pen name on Craveen Eving, or the Pleasant Little Branch in Irish, he wrote plays and stories in Irish, which were then staged at the Abbey Theatre, which was founded by Lady Gregory and W.B. Yeats. He was eventually appointed Professor of Modern Irish at UCD and finally in 1938 he became the first President of Ireland. So he qualified as a member of noteworthy significant people that Q Lane was interested in having portraits painted of. Yeats made several sketches of Douglas Hyde as well as other as well as another quite very similar in format portrait that you can see in the National Gallery. Now, this particular work that we're looking at here was not actually painted for Hugh Lane. It wasn't part of the Hugh Lane Commission, but was actually owned by a friend of Yeats called Dr. Fitzgerald, an eye specialist, actually, who presented it to the collection in 1904 when Lane was calling for donations for the proposed new modern art gallery. Now, as I said earlier, Yeats's painting style had been developing over his career. From the detailed pre-Raphaelite narratives of his early work to the more direct and freer naturalism of his later paintings. By 1900 his painting style had developed again, possibly under the influence of Impressionism. And he was very concerned with trying to catch the initial impress impression of a person's character. And this is quite ironic in a way for a man who was always changing his work and who took so long to finish it. He wanted to reveal not simply a likeness, but a, a sense of the sitter's individual presence. And I think that you can see it here in this painting of Douglas Hyde. Hyde looks straight out at us from the frame. He's sitting relaxed in an armchair, his arms crossed and his legs, his arms, his legs crossed and his arms folded on his lap. His body's at an angle, but he faces the viewer directly. He makes eye contact so we can get a glimpse of his personality. He's formally dressed, so he presents as a man of substance. But his, but his expression is not formal. 
He looks like he knows the painter. There is a bond between the two, and this is what Yeats has managed to catch. He concentrates on the eyes and the face. That is the focus of the painting, the central emphasis of the painting, and these reveal the character. The rest of the picture is quite sketchy and done in broad, loose brush strokes, with some of the details quite blurred. For example, his hands are quite blurry, and you only get the barest impression of his watch chain at his waist. Yeats concentrates on the essentials, and you see more or less the same techniques with his portrait of Singh that I showed you earlier. Here, this one. He concentrates on his face, Singh's face, rather than the surrounding details. Yeats's use of colour is conventional. He uses dark tones suitable for a, con a conservative portrait. And then the red cravat and with yellow tie gives visual relief to the overall muted effect. This was a common technique that you often see in academic paintings. And it contrasts with the unconventionality of Yeats's loose brush strokes. So he combines modern and academic techniques in these portraits. The background is quite indistinct. It's almost like preliminary sketching. For example, you can barely see the outline of the chair behind his head. I'm not sure you can see it at all. You can just see it. Um, maybe Yates was still in the process of changing it when he finally had to give it up. Um, it's impossible to tell by now. Now, as well as Hugh Lane, the Sarah Purser exhibition also brought Yeats to the attention of John Quinn, who was a wealthy Irish-American collector. He bought paintings from the exhibition from both artists, John B. Yeats and Nathaniel Holm, and then he went on to commission further work from Yeats. Now, he's actually the source of some very fine paintings by Yeats that are now in the National Gallery, portraits of John O'Leary, um, William Butler Yeats and some others. And Quinn was to eventually prove to be a very important friend of, and patron of Yeats in the last years of his life. Now Yeats had come over from London to Ireland for the Sarah Purser exhibition and he stayed there afterwards. He stayed on in Ireland afterwards, becoming a very well-known personality in the city. And people loved to visit his studio because he was a very sociable person and they really enjoyed themselves there. However, he continued to have money troubles. And his inability to finish his paintings meant that commissions dried up. Now, in the meantime, his daughters had come over to Dublin from London to set up Dunemer Industries. And so he moved in with them there. By 1906, his career as a painter in Dublin was more or less at an end. Orpen had taken over the Hugh Lane Commission and a new portrait painter called Antonio Mancini, who was actually a protege of Lane, had arrived in the city. Now, he was proving to be very popular. And William Butler Yeats actually chose a portrait by Mancini of him for the frontispiece of a new collection of his poems. Now, Yeats was actually very offended by this, which he felt was an insult to him. He painted many portraits of his son, such as, for example, this one, which were universally admired. Unfortunately, Yeats and his son William actually had quite a difficult relationship. Um, Yeats often had to rely on William for financial support because he had so much and so many money troubles himself and he felt himself to be a failure in comparison with his son who was by now becoming very famous and successful internationally. Yeats's friends felt sorry for him partly as a result of this. So in 1906 they collected funds to send him on a holiday to Italy. His daughter Lily was travelling to New York at the same time to sell crafts at an international fair there. And at the very last minute, Yates decided to use the money to go with her instead to the US. And as it turned out, he didn't come back and he never saw three of his children again. Now, however, he was a great letter writer and he kept up a constant and extensive correspondence with the different members of his family. So it's not that they never heard from him again. He actually always intended to return to Ireland and for many years he even kept paying the rent on his Dublin studio and in his letters he constantly talked about coming home soon. Uh, John Quinn, who had become very close friend to him by now, supported him in New York and helped to pay the rent at the boarding house in West 29th Street where Yeats lived. 
Now, in fact, Yeats enjoyed himself immensely in New York and moving there gave him a new lease of life at the age of 68. He, was, he managed to earn some money selling sketches and giving talks. And people who knew him said that he had the character of a young man housed in the body of an old one. And his letters bear this out, particularly those to his friend Rosa Bott, whose portrait you can see here, made by Yeats. Now this really is a friendship portrait. Rosa was the daughter of Isaac Bott, and she and Yeats had known each other briefly when they were young. But apart from the time he painted her portrait in 1900, when they were both in their 60s, they don't seem to have met again. But they started up an intimate correspondence when he moved to New York, where she remained based in London. They had agreed to destroy their letters once read, and he appears to have done this. She, however, kept the ones she received, so they have eventually come down to us. And they read like the love letters of a young man, even though both parties were by now in their 70s. Yeats even writes as though they were married. For example, he writes things like, I think of you constantly again and again. I love you every day and in every way. The letters are very romantic. And I think that they show that Yeats retained the mind of a young man right to the end of his life. And this is one of the things that attracted people to him. Finally, in New York, Yeats received his last commission. In 1911, John Quinn asked him to paint his self-portrait. And in a way, I think that the story of this final commission sums up Yeats's artistic career. Now, he received the portrait very, he received the commission very enthusiastically. He began working on it immediately and kept at it on and off. He talked about it lots of times in his letters home. It was going to be his master his masterpiece and he promised that he would come home when it was finished. He used this as an excuse for not coming home. He said he couldn't come home until he finished this painting. He worked on it in his room in West 29th Street and he kept changing it as he was wont to do, scraping bits out, starting again and it was hanging over his bed when he died there in 1922, 11 years after he started it. And here it is. Effectively, it's Yeats in his studio. And I think he looks very happy and very hopeful. It's somewhat different in style to his earlier work. It's brighter, it's more colorful, it's less finished. It's actually a bit more like paintings of the post-impressionist period. And this suggests that Yeats was open to new artistic ideas throughout his life, even in his 80s. You can also see that the surface is heavily worked with signs of having been painted over and over again. So Yeats effectively finished his life still trying to perfect his art. So there you have the story of John Butler Yeats and this very fine painting of Douglas Hyde that you can see in the gallery. And I hope you'll come back and visit in person again when it's safe to do so. Thank you very much and goodbye.